I've always loved stories about wolves. They're used to represent the outcast, the misunderstood, the human fascination with what is considered wild and animal. The way wolves were used as a motif in fiction only made me all the more interested in what they could be like in reality. To a young autistic kid, wolves made sense. Wolves were simple. Humans were not. Humans had facial expressions that I had to struggle to decipher, complex social norms that I kept overstepping. Wolves, however, had the strong bonds that I lacked and were able to run around, roughhouse, and be as messy as they pleased without getting chastised for it. No one ever tried to tell a wolf to lower its voice. It looked so fun and freeing to be a wolf, which was why I couldn't understand why werewolf movies always acted as if becoming a wolf was something to be feared and lamented, rather than celebrated and embraced. When I was around nine years old, my aunt took me into this anime store. There was this TV set up with a movie playing. A woman and her son were talking to a wolf through the bars of a cage, explaining that the boy could shapeshift into a wolf and needed someone to guide him through that side of himself. My aunt was getting impatient and she began to nudge me out of the store, but not before I could memorize the title on the poster they had set up next to the screen. Wolf Children. Wolf Children tells the story of a human named Hana, who is trying to raise her two children, Ame and Yuki, on her own after their shapeshifting father, whose powers the kids inherited, is killed all while keeping her children's secret. The family starts off in the city. There are neighbors who complain about the howling they hear coming from Hana's apartment, crowded streets filled with stimuli that could trigger a transformation in front of dozens of witnesses. There's no space for the kids to run around, nowhere they can be their wolf selves. So Hana moves them out to the remote countryside where she hopes Ame and Yuki will be able to be themselves without fear. One night it snows, and the scene that results is, without exaggeration, my favorite movie scene of all time. The kids transform freely, fluidly, going from human to wolf, human to wolf, and back again, based on whatever they are feeling in that moment. They slide down hills, do backflips, show off to one another, all while Hana runs after them with the biggest smile on her face. There's this one brilliant shot where you look through the children's eyes as they dash and leap around. And whenever it comes on, I swear I feel like a wolf. The scene ends with all three of them tumbling down a hill and then tossing their heads back to howl at this unbelievably blue sky. No more hushing, no more restraint. In this moment, Ame and Yuki can be whatever they feel like at the top of their lungs and without fear. And Hana, mild human Hana, lets herself howl along with them. Howling is not something that humans are supposed to do. Hana's neighbors in the city would have deemed it inappropriate, along with everything else she and her children were doing that day. But Hana realizes that while it may not be in her nature the way it is in her children's, it's still kind of fun. For some of us, though, those societal expectations of what is and isn't acceptable are a bit harder to unlearn. Sometimes the shove people need to start acting like a wolf is to physically become one. Wolfwalkers is a movie set in 17th century Kilkenny and focuses on Robin Goodfellow, the daughter of a hunter who the English have brought to Ireland to aid their colonial ambitions and kill all of its wolves. While trying to help her father, Robin gets caught in one of their own traps and a wolf tries to free her, but she struggles and the wolf accidentally bites her instead. That night, Robin wakes up outside her body in the form of a wolf. She flees into the woods only to run into the very creature that bit her who turns out to be a shapeshifter named Mev. While Robin is horrified and overwhelmed by her new situation, Mev is ecstatic and resolves to show Robin just how awesome being a wolf can be. She starts off by teaching Robin that when you're a wolf, Don't need your eyes to see. You can sense everything around you through scent and sound. The animation style shifts into some first-person shots, stylized with rough charcoal and popping colors. Waves of sound, vibrations, and smells are all visualized. Just like with wolf children, these first-person visuals immerse the audience until they feel like they're the wolf. Robin doesn't have any friends in Kilkenny, but here in the forest, she's suddenly been granted a whole pack. The forest is hours a night, Mev tells her. And for this moment, it truly is. They tilt their heads back in the rain, taking nature in instead of hiding from it within human structures, and howl as the type of community, the type of family that Robin's never found before. 
This final scene is going to be a bit harder to visualize, as unlike the past two, it is from a book, not a movie. And the narrator is blindfolded. But I think if Wolf Walker has taught us anything, it's that you don't need to see to experience being a wolf. The Devourers by Indra Das tells the story of a carnivorous species whose true forms are bestial, but can disguise themselves as people they've previously eaten. And what happens when two humans in different time periods become aware of this species' existence. One of these humans is Sira, a woman in the Mughal Empire who is trying to hunt down a shapeshifter that attacked her. She's helped by his former mate, another devourer named Jevadon. The dynamic between Sira and Jevadon is one of the most fascinating that I've ever read and can't be defined with a simple label. Every interaction between them is a struggle for power. They're simultaneously revolted and fascinated by what the other is, and that fascination threatens what they think they understand about themselves. During one of their bits of banter, Sira dares Jevadon to show her his true form. He protests. It is sacred. No human may lay eyes on it except as prey or one of us. But after further goading from her, Jevadon comes up with a loophole. Humans may not be allowed to see a devourer, but if Sarah were to blindfold herself, she'd still be able to use her other senses to interact with his true form. The passage that comes next could be summarized, but not in a way that would do it justice. This is the type of scene that just needs to be read. I heard him pacing, feet stamping the dew-damp ground, loud slaps as the pacing became faster. I heard the thump of fist on tree trunk, the bone-breaking splintering of wood, and it felt like the whole forest shook with each crash, the treetops swaying and the leaves hushing, the birds bursting from their roosts and screeching above us. I heard his growls grow deeper until it sounded like he was vomiting out his very soul. I heard the sound of sap spilled and bark torn from the trees, rings with what sounded like blades but could not be. And then... Silence. I could hear it. Feel it breathing. The rumbling of a mountain slumbering through centuries slivered to seconds. It walked to me, twigs snapping sharp under its great hands and feet, soil squelching under its enormous impossible weight. Come, I whispered to it, and it was as if I could feel it smiling, inhuman, fangs bared. I stepped forward and my breath hitched as my fingers met fur and skin, thick and coarse. I ran my hands across it, feeling its vibrations hum in my own flesh. I breathed out a feather-like gasp, the thin air of my lungs meeting with the heavy humor of the beasts. I laughed. It said nothing. It didn't bark or spit or growl. It only continued to rumble under my fingers, filling me with an ecstasy that I cannot express to this day. Tears ran down my cheeks from under the rag and I felt a throb deep in my chest. I felt like weeping, wailing like one bereaved. I don't remember if I heard its words in my head, or just felt it, but I knew it was waiting. I knew it wanted me to climb onto it. Sira climbs onto Jevadon's back and he runs. They go crashing through trees, pounding across the ground, plunging into the waters of the Yamuna River. Clinging to his back the way she is, both of them can sense every single movement the other makes, as if it was one from their own body. The Devourers loves to blur the line between where one character begins and another ends, and this is one of the scenes where Sira and Jevadon get to overlap. Up until now, Sira has been prey, trying to escape the grasp of powers beyond her control. But here, one of those very forces has recognized the strength that she holds and deemed her worthy to share his own strength with. I laughed and I laughed and I screamed louder than I had ever before, not caring who or what heard me. My body shaking as it purged all the sorrows of my life in one howl that lived with us. These scenes aren't just about transforming into wolves. They're about sharing that transformation with someone else. Someone who has never experienced it before. 
getting to see them discover a part of themselves that they'd never been able to reach, perhaps because they didn't even know they could look. It's about sharing a part of yourself that you constantly have to keep restrained in spite of the great joy it brings you and having someone else react with that same excitement it has always made you feel. It's about teaching humans to become wolves, whether they can actually transform into them or not. Thank you so much for watching this video. It's my first one and I'm super stoked to have it out there. Let me know in the comments what shapeshifting means to you and send me your werewolf media recommendations. Are there more scenes like these ones that I missed? If you enjoyed, please leave a like. And if you want to see more, then subscribing tells YouTube to continue recommending my videos to you and others. If you click the bell next to the subscribe icon, you'll even be notified whenever I post. If you want to support me even further, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I've set up a Patreon where you can access behind the scenes content, such as director's commentaries and concept art, for a monthly subscription that'll help me fund the making of future videos. I've put a link in the description for those of you who want to check it out. Thank you so much for sticking here until the end, and I can't wait to make more of these videos soon. See ya!